Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on the book of Daniel. If you know much about the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you know that Daniel has been a great study of ours since the beginning of our days. And this is lesson number 12 on our study on Daniel from March 21 of 2020, entitled, From North and South to the Beautiful Land. Okay, we'll see what that is all about. We like to do as usual and begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we thank you for these words of wisdom, even though some of them may be very difficult to understand, but yet what we can get from the context and from the material itself helps us to understand that you fully are aware in advance of everything that's going to happen. It gives us confidence to know that you are in charge. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I don't think there's anybody would argue with the fact that Daniel 11 is by far the most <clears throat> challenging chapter in the book of Daniel. Commentators have often jumped over it, making few of any comments, a whole big old commentary, and there'll be just a few paragraphs on Daniel 11. But there are several things that we <clears throat> need to notice one this chapter is covering the long history of battles between various forces and therefore it must be somewhat parallel to what we have already learned in daniel 2 and 7 and 8 and 9 as it is covering the same history of the same world so there ought to be some parallels right two down through the ages various forces have oppressed god's people and made life very difficult for them Fortunately, Daniel 11, along with the other prophetic chapters, tells us that when it is all finished, there will be a happy ending. Daniel 11 can be divided into three basic sections. One, a discussion of the Persian kings following the days of Daniel. That's fairly short. A long section dealing with battles and various efforts to com compromise between the king of the north and the king of the south. And then three, just as Daniel 2 ends with a stone cut out of the mountain which grinds a sta statue to chaff in Daniel 2, 4, 44, and Daniel 11, a glorious holy mountain conquers the king of the north, thus eliminating God's last enemies. So after Cyrus and Persia, three successive kings dominated. One, Cambyses, Cyrus's son, from 530 to 522. False Smyrtus, 522, he just lasted a short time. Darius the first from 522 to 486, so he ruled for quite a long time. And the fourth very wealthy king is known as Xerxes, who is the Ahasuerus of the book of Esther. You read about that in Esther 1, verses 1 to 7. Xerxes, or Ahasuerus, felt that with all his might and power, he could invade Greece. But a smaller force of valiant Greek soldiers repelled him. The Greeks never forgot that attack. Alexander paid them back. When Alexander the Greek died at a very young age, his empire was divided among his four generals. We read the following. Dennis? Daniel eleven three to 4 And a mighty king will arise, and he will rule with great authority and do as he pleases. But as soon as he has risen, his kingdom will be broken up and parceled out toward the four points of the compass though not uh, to his own descendants, nor according to his authority which he wielded. For his sovereignty will be uprooted and given to others besides them. That's from the New American Standard Bible. Okay, and you will notice in our studies of Daniel already, and more so in this lesson, that um, I have gone through and tried to pick uh, translations that fit best with what the lesson is trying to portray, so it's a little easier to see the, the sequence of thought. Well, after the Alexander the Great's conquest, he died during a drunken stupor in Babylon. He was thinking about making Babylon his future headquarters. The kingdom was divided among his four generals, Seleucus over Syria and Mesopotamia, including all the way over to, into Babylon, to Ptolemy over Egypt, three, Lysimachus over Thrace and portions of Asia Minor, and four, Cassander over Macedonia and Greece. So we don't have any trouble identifying 
uh, Alexander the Great is a prominent king of Greece mentioned in Daniel 11, 2-4 by comparing it with Daniel 8, 3-8 and 20-22 where the names of the countries that are involved are given specifically. So if we can line these things out side by side, there really is no question about who that individual is. Well, we can, by looking at the data that we have in the book of Daniel, we, we can determine that Daniel was writing this message around the year 539 B.C. So all you Daniel and Revelation experts, what happened in 539 B.C.? We're all jumping at the chance to answer that question. <laughs> that was the year that Cyrus conquered Babylon. Oh. Oh, okay. But he was predicting precisely events that happened more than 200 years later. Once again, we see that God's word never fails. Do you think God is able to predict the future because he can somehow see events in advance? Or does he control the future, make it come out the way he prophesied? Or he both? Sees the future. Well, I think both. Maybe both in some both cases. Because, because he's interactive with it. Yeah, he's not he, just sitting back from yeah. it and saying, this is going to happen and that's going to happen. He's also going to be kind of guides. involved. I mean, in one place it says that he takes, puts in the kings and he takes them out. I mean, he yeah. does have some control there. Another way you could say that he allows kings to be set up and allows things to be taken down. It, it, yeah. Remember in Genesis 1, it says he gave dominion. And if God's manipulating our future, Who's to be responsible for our own actions? Okay, Margaret, I think you have something more to add to that. Okay, this is Daniel 11, 5 to 14. The king of Egypt will be strong. One of his generals, however, will be even stronger and rule a greater kingdom. After a number of years, the king of Egypt will make an alliance with the king of Syria and give him his daughter in marriage. But the alliance will not last. And she, her husband, her child, and the servants who went with her were all be killed. Soon afterwards, one of her relatives will become king. He will attack the army of the king of Syria, enter their fortress, and defeat them. He will carry back to Egypt the images of their gods and the articles of gold and silver dedicated to those gods. After several years of peace, the king of Syria will invade Egypt but he will be forced to retreat. The sons of the king of Syria will prepare for war and gather a large army. One of them will sweep on like a flood and attack an enemy fortress. In his anger, the king of Egypt will go to war against the king of Syria and capture his huge army. He will be proud of his victory and of the many soldiers he has killed, but he will not continue to be victorious. The king of Syria will go back and gather a larger army than he had before. When the proper time comes, he will return with a large, well-equipped army. Then many people will rebel against the king of Egypt, and some of the violent from your nation, Daniel, will rebel because of a vision they have seen, but they will be defeated. Okay. And this comes from the American Bible Society, the Good News Translation. So there, instead of just seeing king of the north and king of the south, he puts in the names of Syria and Egypt and so forth and tries to suggest. And um, there's certain parts of that story is pretty clear who it, who's involved, especially the story with the, the daughter who was married to, from Egypt, went and married the, the, the king of the, in the north, and then his ex-wife, uh, got rid of her and her husband and so forth. Anyway. Yeah, that's, that's coming next to this. <laughs> yeah. But uh, most Bible questions, some of the violent from your nation, who is that referring to? Telling Daniel. That's yeah. a hard thing to figure out. Yeah. Most Bible students understand the wars between the king of the north and the king of the south prophesied in Daniel 11, 5 to 14 is referring to, many, to the many battles involving these two dynasties. You know, it's incredible. These are both Greek people, you know. I don't know whether they're just trying to show who's the most powerful or what's the whole idea there. According to the prophecy, an attempt would be made to unite. Is Jim supposed to be reading That's that? That's all right. No. Okay, I'm sorry. Well, I didn't realize. No, I like that. These two dynasties were married, but the alliance will be short-lived. Go ahead. You can read the rest, Jim. Historical sources inform us that Antiochus II 
Theos from 261 to 246 BC, grandson of Seleucus I, married Bernice, a daughter of the Egyptian king, Ptolemy II Philadelphus. His former wife killed Bernice and her son when Ptolemy died. However, that agreement did not last, and the conflict that directly involved the people of God soon resumed. Thus, Daniel 11 deals with some very important events that will touch the lives of God's people during the centuries after the prophet Daniel passes from the scene. Okay, from our perspective in time, we might wonder about the central part of Daniel 11. Why did God give us all these details and some of which we may not be sure what they really refer to? And so what do you think is the reason for that? Does God need to give all that kind of detail? Well, it affected his people. Yeah, it certainly affected his people. And why, why do we say it affected his people? Where, was the, where were the Ptolemies located? Egypt. Egypt. Yeah. Egypt. And where were the Seleucids uh, located? North of Palestine. So they have to go They're back and forth through, through Palestine to do their fighting, don't they? Mm -hmm. So you can imagine how much that affected the children of Israel. Well, <clears throat> aren't you thankful that a God who knows the future in advance and is loving, kind, and benevolent is our God and that we can know him? Carrie? Yes, I'm going to read from Isaiah 46, 9, and 10. Remember what happened long ago. Acknowledge that I alone am God and that there is no one else like me. From the beginning, I predicted the outcome. Long ago, I foretold what would happen. I said that my plans would never fail, that I would do everything I intended to do. <coughs> I think... think Go ahead. I think right there it tells us that God is not a, just a bystander. These yes. are his plans and they will not fail and this is what he intends to do. Yeah. It's very interesting those chapters from uh, chapter 40 to 54, 55 in Isaiah. This kind of idea is repeated again and again. The idea that, you know, there's two, what are the two things that, that distinguish a true God from all <laughs> false gods? Do you remember that we've studied this? He creates out of nothing and he, he creates out of future. nothing and he can predict the future far in advance. And I mean, how could anyone argue with that? Anyone like to predict what's going to happen to Wall Street tomorrow? Well, t today it really went up. <laughs> yeah, well. It's a good record. <clears throat> then we go to Daniel 11, 16 to 28. I'll read part of that. The Syrian invader will do with with them as he pleases without opposition. He will stand in the promised land and have it completely in his power. And we know that th that happened a few times. The king of Syria will plan an expedition using his whole army. Then in order to destroy his enemy's kingdom, he will make an alliance with him and offer his daughter in marriage, but his plan will not succeed. After that, he will attack the nations by the sea and conquer many of them. But a foreign leader will defeat him and put an end to his arrogance. Indeed, he will turn the arrogance of Syria's king back on him. The king will return to the fortresses of his own land, but he will be defeated, and that, he will, and that will be the end of him. He will be followed by another king who will send an officer to oppress the people with taxes in order to increase the wealth of his kingdom. In a short time, that king will be killed, but not publicly and not in battle. So I'm going to stop there. Um, <clears throat> how you understand these verses will depend very much on the understanding of the translators of each section. So we need to be honest, the people who try to make some kind of sense, like our lesson here, out of, the, uh, out of chapter 11, what they're doing is they're going through and they're skipping over stuff that they really don't think they understand for sure, and picking out the things that we're pretty sure we know what that means, we're pretty sure we know what this means, we're pretty sure we know what this means, and then they're seeing they can fit all that in. Now, that requires a certain amount of uh, guessing and adjusting and so forth, but that's the best we can do with, with Daniel 11, really, under the circumstances. Hmm. And of course, the question would be, the question at that point is, do you believe God can predict the future? Because that, if you don't believe God can predict the future, then that throws the whole thing into a real tizzy. 
Daniel 11.16, which we read, suggests a transition of power from the Hellenistic kings of Greece to pagan Rome. We recognize the glorious land as being Israel with its capital in Jerusalem. The new power that arose in the world in those days, of course, was Rome. Okay, Gordon? Daniel 11, 20 to 21 from the New King James Version. There shall arise in his place one who imposes taxes on the glorious kingdom, but within a few days he shall be destroyed, but not in anger or in battle, and in his place shall arise a vile person to whom they will not give the honor of royalty, but he shall come in peaceably and seize the kingdom by intrigue. And then these comments from the Bible study guide. Yeah. Some additional clues in the biblical text reinforce the perception, uh, this perception. For example, the one who imposes taxes or oppressor or exactor of taxes must refer to Caesar Augustus. It is during his reign that Jesus is born as Mary and Joseph travel to Bethlehem for the census. Also, according to the prophecy, this ruler will be succeeded by a vile person. As history show, Augustus was succeeded by Tiberius, an adoptive son of Augustus. Tiberius is known to have been an eccentric and vile person. That's from the Bible Study Guide for Tuesday. Now, we know a fair amount about that time period. So, do you remember the details about how Tiberius succeeded Augustus? Anybody remember that? Tiberius married a lady who already had a son who was Tiberius. So Tiberius was really his adopted son. Son, And we know that Augustus relates to the Bible story, of, the story of Jesus, how, in what way? Well, he was Caesar when Jesus was born. So that's why that Joseph... All the world would that sent out the decree that all the world will would be, be taxed. taxed. Yeah. Okay, and then Tiberius, how was Tiberius related to the story of Jesus? Remember his time period? We need some work on history here, I guess. Huh? He was the one who was emperor from really the childhood of Jesus right through past his, his uh, he's the one appointed Pilate and so forth, and the one who ultimately, theoretically, was responsible for the death of Jesus. Oh. So he covers that, that whole period. Okay. Do we know when he started? When was the beginning of his reign? He was, uh, now you're going to ask me the exact Before? details, but I'll, 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 I'll give you a rough idea. I don't hold me to the exact figure, but he became co-regent of that area in uh, the year 12, I believe it was, and then became full ruler in about 18 or something like that. Something like that, and then he ruled on until about 40. So he was the, he was the, the emperor, the king, during basically the entire life of Jesus, except when for... When did Augusta die? Augustus. Augustus died, that would have been around about, again, well, I don't. I should have looked at these exact dates, but somewhere around 18 or something like that, or 15 to 18, somewhere in there. What he died, then Tiberius took over full control. So Tiberius, it, it, the one that beheaded John the Baptist, then too. Well, was, of course, yeah. it was it was Herod. It was Herod, but, that actually, yeah. but he was ultimately over his was o over all of over all of that. Yes, yeah, exactly. So, um, and the incredible thing is, if you go back and look at this history and this. This just blows me away, and I've had the privilege of traveling in that part of the world and seeing some of the evidence for this. The way our understanding of the 70-week prophecy and the 2300-year prophecy and exactly the, how it fits with the, with the baptism of Jesus and his death, his crucifixion, and then the stoning of Stephen and the scat scattering to the Gentiles, and then you pick up the, the, with the story of Paul and how that fits, and you can, there are actually uh, things carved in stone in Corinth that, co that confirm the, the story of Paul, how that fits, and then there's moreover in Delphi, uh, where there's another thing that fits together with all that, and I won't go into all the details, but if you put these things all together and you, you see exactly how they fit, 
It's amazing. Everything, tunk, 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 mm. tunk, 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 right down, including these. I mean, this the thing in Corinth is still. It's just a, a big old chunk of marble, I think it is, or granite in the ground, and there it is, carved in stone. You know, and it helps to confirm everything we know about this history. Wow. Amazing. Okay. Continuing Daniel eleven twenty two from the New King James Version. With the force of a flood, they shall be swept away from before him and be broken, and also the prince of the covenant. Okay, so here we come to the next point where we think we know for sure who is the prince of the covenant. Jesus. Yeah, that has to be Jesus. In, in terms of what we know from Scripture, that has to be Jesus. So, again, you may not know all the details along the way, but here's, a, here's a, a one point that you can pretty much nail down. We know when that happened. So the reference to the Prince of the Covenant should be clear to all Christians. In the midst of these massive battles and wars between empires, we note the crucifixion of the Prince of the Covenant. And of course, we've already talked about that in Daniel 9.25 and comparing. Uh, and let me just look at the passage in Matthew 27. You'll see a little bit about how it fits together here. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine mixed with a bitter substance, but after tasting it, he would not drink it. They crucified him and then divided his clothes among them by throwing dice. After they had sat there and watched him, after that they sat there and watched him. Above his head they heard, they put the written notice of the accusation against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then they crucified two bandits with Jesus, one on, each, on his right and the other on his left. And, of course, that's a familiar part of the story to all of us. And I, I won't go ahead and read the whole rest of it, but we know the story. Assuming that we are correct about the previous passage being a reference to the activities of pagan Rome, which seems quite clear, and the story about the Prince of the Covenant, which we are quite sure is Jesus, what power arose after pagan Rome? Daniel eleven thirty six. Then the king will do as he pleases, and he will exalt and magnify himself above every god, and will speak monstrous things against the god of gods. And he will prosper until the indignation is finished, for that which is decreed will be done. New American Standard, 1995. Okay, so what does that sort of imply to you? Is this talking about battles between a couple of uh, national armies here? Not at all. What is this? When when he speaks monstrous th monstrous things against the God of gods, sounds like the vicar. Sounds like yeah. someone. This sounds like a religious thing, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Very much like a religious something or other. Well, let's see what we can figure out. It seems clear that these verses are referring to a new power system. It followed the pagan Roman Empire, but manifested some of the same characteristics. So as we look further, we find that it acts as a religious power. It aims its attack mainly at God and his people. Let us look at some of the actions perpetrated by this king. First, he will act in a rage against the Holy Covenant, Daniel 11.30, NKJV. This must be a reference to God's covenant of salvation, which this king opposes. Second, this king will produce forces that will defile the sanctuary and take away the daily sacrifices, Daniel 11.31. We noted in Daniel 8 that the little horn casts down the foundations of God's sanctuary and takes away the daily sacrifices, Daniel 8.11. This must be understood as a spiritual attack against Christ's ministration in the heavenly sanctuary. Now, we, we must be humble and honest to, rec to say that uh, this seems clear to us, but none of our Christian friends have this interpretation of this passage. Third, as a consequence of his attack on the sanctuary, this power places the abomination of desolation, NKJV, in God's temple. The parallel expression, transgression of desolation, points to the acts of apostasy and rebellion by the little horn referred to in Daniel 8.13. Fourth, this power persecutes God's people. Some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the time of the end. So now, how does falling make them, refine them, purify them, and make them white? You figure that out? 
Well, is that death? Some of them shall. They would be of martyrs. Understanding shall fall. I'd say it's they die. Yeah. That refines them and purifies them, makes yeah. them white. So this reminds us of the little horn which cast down some of the host and some of the stars and trampled them. And in this context, stars would mean who? Angels. Could be angels. He Messengers. obviously brought down a lot of angels. And it could also be God's faithful people. In Revelation, the stars are the leaders of the churches. Yeah. And Revelation some 1. Some people might say the angels of the church, you know, the messengers or the human leaders. So it could be an understood. Okay, and phrase. fifth, this king will exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods. Unsurprisingly, the little horn also speaks pompous words, even against God. You can read about that in Daniel 7, 8, and 25. Other similarities could be mentioned, but considering what we read in Daniel 7 and 8, who is this power and why is it so important to us, despite social pressures, to stay firm in our identification of this power? That's from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Wednesday, March 18. And I don't think I have to tell any of you that uh, this impacts our church's ministry every day. When we go on television, do we dare to specifically name the Roman Catholic Church, yeah. the Roman Catholic system? When we preach in our church right, right, right across the street over here, um, there's a great reluctance to specifically mention the Roman Catholic Church. Is, is that, should we, should we avoid that or should we come out as we traditionally did and speak very bluntly about what we think about the Roman Catholic system. Which do you think is the right approach? Well, I think there are a lot of very sincere, loving people in the Roman Catholic Church. Absolutely. That love God with all their heart. Does yeah. that make their, go ahead. Yeah, and Ellen White talks about not stirring up yeah. before the time, you know. Yeah. I, I didn't bring it, but there's something to the effect sure. of, you know, not being too... Don't make some, too many rod, rude threats thrust against the Catholics. Right, yeah. right. On the other hand, I mean, the other side of that coin, and I agree with you, on the other side of that coin is, is not the people we're condemning. The it's people the who believe in sincere, what we're condemning is the system. Yeah. And I mean, you know all the bad press that the Catholic Church has had recently, and that's just a small part of the whole thing. Uh, we need to speak in love, we need to be honest, we need to be fair, but we also need to be, to be truthful. I wonder a bit, when we look at what we have traditionally as Seventh-day Adventists in our belief system, about that, very little do I hear anyone talk about the Islamic forces at the end of time. Yeah. Now, maybe it's not just the Catholic Church. It's yeah. any force. I think it's coming down to just those two, basically. Yeah. Yeah, just if coming down to where anyone that goes against the God of heaven could be lumped into that group, regardless of what church they go to. Any and pagan. Any turn pagan, your back on it. Yeah, any pagan system is, is contrary to the teachings of the infinite one. And ultimately, that would have to include communism. Of course. It's and atheism, yeah. and that would mean that includes evolution. We don't like to, people don't like to admit that, but evolution is atheism. Oh, yeah. It's Politics is pretty interesting. What, listening to, what is his name, Ron Reagan talking about leading out the atheistic movement. I'm not the least bit afraid to die in hell. We saw that the other well, night. But he, didn't say, he, said, he, he said burn in hell, at my burn understanding. Hell, okay. yeah. Well, he'll already be dead anyway, so people go to crematoriums and burn, so what's the big deal? He just, he's just rather uninformed. And yeah. yeah, that's it, uninformed. The ignorance of yeah. uh, it just well, He doesn't want to acknowledge God. Yeah. Dennis, I think you have what comes next there. Okay, so we're at Daniel eleven forty to 45. At the end time, the king of the south will collide with him, and the king of the north will storm against him with chariots, with horsemen, and with many ships, and he will enter countries, overflow them, and pass through. 
Can I stop for a second? Sure. What do you, uh, several times these translations use the word overflow, and that apparently is a fairly direct translation of the Hebrew. Why do you suppose God uses that word? Does that seem strange? Like overflow. A flood, maybe it's like yeah. a flood. Like a, it would be like a flood. Uh, in this translation, it says he will invade various lands and sweep through them like a flood. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that, that makes it maybe a little bit clearer. Okay, Dennis, go ahead. He will also enter the beautiful land, and many countries will fall, but these will be rescued out of his hand, Edom, Moab, and the foremost of the sons of Ammon. Then he will stretch out his hand against other countries, and the land of Egypt will not escape. But he will gain control over the hidden treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt, and Libyans and Ethiopians will follow at his heels. But rumors from the east and from the north will disturb him, and he will go forth with great wrath to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch the tents of his royal pavilion between the seas and the beautiful holy mountain. Yet he will come to his end, and no one will help him. Okay. That's got a lot of mystery in it. Yeah, it got a lot of mystery. Who are these Edom, Moab, and Ammon stuff? I mean... Those kingdoms, whatever they were, even in the day, well, they, they had disappeared in the days of Jesus, even. They were gone. But now, obviously, they were, these were sons of Ishmael, Ishmael. sons of Lot's daughters, and mm -hmm. so forth. Um, sons of Abraham. But also Grand children. Of Abraham. Sons of Abraham. Some of them were sons, sons of Abraham, yeah. Wow. Well, in these verses, we have come to what Daniel referred to as the time of the end. Is that the same as the end of time? Yeah. Not exactly. Well, the end of time would be when time stops. The okay. time of the end would be before that for Period a leading thousand up years before that, maybe. How long? A thousand years before that. Well, I think that's probably a little too much, but... Oh, I don't know. The real end of time would be the third coming, wouldn't it? As far as people Possibly. on this earth, to yeah. me, that's what it means. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to see some, some fairly careful study on what that might mean as we, toward the end of this lesson. Well, in these verses, we have come to what I said, we said the time of the end or the end time. It is interesting to notice that this expression occurs only in the book of Daniel. Why do you suppose that is? Daniel 8, 17, 11, 35, and 40, and 12, 4, and 9. Daniel uses it several times. And he's back there so far in history. <clears throat> no other writer is really talking about the end of time. Yeah. Except Revelation. Yeah, carefully comparing these verses indicates that the time of the end began with the fall of the papacy in 1798 mm -hmm. and extends to the second coming of Jesus. Or possibly, as Jim suggested, Maybe the third coming. Look at just that passage really quick, Daniel 12, 2. Many of those who have already died will live again. Some will enjoy eternal life and some will suffer eternal disgrace. So in that what we call the special resurrection, um, we'll talk about that more in our next lesson. There will be differences in the way some of those people are handled. For those of us who live in the time of the end, so are we now in the time of the end? Mm -hmm. yeah. We are. An important question must be, who are the king of the north and the king of the south in our day? Syria and Egypt are no longer battling each other. These names must be referring to something more contemporary. All right. The king of the north. This name first geographically designates the Seleucid dynasty, but then it refers to pagan and finally papal Rome. As such, it does not describe a geographical location, but the spiritual enemy of God's people. In addition, we also should note that the king of the north represents a counterfeit of the true God, who in the Bible is symbolically... Symbolically... King of the south. No, no, no. No. Associated. Associated with the north. A co who is symbolically associated with the north. I'm sorry. Thank you. Let, let's stop there for a moment. So king of the north, we're talking about the spiritual enemy of God's people. 
how, what, what's the difference between a, another enemy, a, some, a regular kind of an enemy, and a spiritual enemy? Well, one would want to kill the body, and the other would want to kill the soul. Yeah. Okay, very good. Location, maybe. And, well... Not philosophy, but location. Where is that geographically? But th that, does that distinguish one group as being spiritual as opposed to physical? We're talking about a spiritual enemy now of God's people. Well, a spiritual enemy uses deceit. Mm-hmm. And that's what mentions right down there below. The king of the north represents a counterfeit of the true God. Yeah. So this enemy is trying to be like God, right? Mm -hmm. Counterfeit. I use, sometimes use the illustration, suppose you went home and you gave your, you know, five or six year old a piece of paper just the right size like this and a green crayon and say, make yourself a dollar bill and ask him to scribble it on there <clears throat> like this, and you go down to the store, and you hand it to the clerk, and say, I want to buy something, and the clerk is going to what? Smile at you and wonder yeah. <laughs> what you're up to. But if you get a professional counterfeiter who's really good and uses the right kind of paper and uses the right kind of ink and so forth and makes a dollar bill or a $20 bill or a $100 bill, there's a pretty good chance you go to the store and it will be accepted. Mm -hmm. So which is the most dangerous, the one that's closest to the real or the one that's the furthest from the real? Of course, the one that's closest. The one that's closest to the real. So the spiritual enemies might be those that seem to be closest to the truth. Would that be fair to say? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's think about that. We're going we're, we're gonna to talk about it some more. Go ahead. Okay, the king of the south. This name at first designates the Ptolemy <laughs> dynasty in Egypt, south of the Holy Land. But as the prophecy unfolds, it acquires a theological dimension and is associated by some scholars with atheism. And this is from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Thursday, March 19th. Yeah, yeah that's why I say it's not necessarily lo <coughs> no, it's not location. broader meaning of it. Yeah. It's how you think mm -hmm. and <laughs> okay Jim I guess the great city in whose streets the witnesses are slain and where their dead bodies lie is spiritually Egypt of all nations presented in Bible history Egypt most boldly denied the existence of the living God and resisted his commands no monarch ever ventured upon more open and high-handed rebellion against the authority of heaven than did the king of Egypt when the message was brought him by Moses in the name of the Lord, Pharaoh proudly answered, quote, Who is Jehovah that I should hearken unto his voice or let Israel go? I know not Jehovah, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. That's Exodus 5, 2. This is atheism, and the nation represented by Egypt would give voice to a similar denial of the claims of the living God and would manifest a like spirit of unbelief and defiance. The great city is also compared spiritually to Sodom. The corruption of Sodom in breaking the law of God was especially manifested in licentiousness, and this sin was also to be a preeminent characteristic of the nation that should fulfill the specifications of this scripture. But again, see, to me, when I read that, it's, has two things. There's a parallel meaning there. It's a place, but it's also a philosophy. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. According to the words of the prophet then, a little before the year 1798, some power of satanic origin and character would rise to make war upon the Bible. And in the land where the testimony of God's two witnesses, the Old Testament and the New Testament, should thus be silenced, there would be manifest the atheism of the Pharaoh and the licentiousness of Sodom. This prophecy was received, has received a most exact and striking fulfillment in the history of France. During the revolution in 1793, <clears throat> the world for the first time heard an assembly of men born and educated in civilization and assuming the right to govern one of the finest of the European nations uplift their united voice 
to deny the most solemn truth which man's soul receives and renounce unanimously the belief and worship of a deity. From Sir wow. Walter Scott's Life of Napoleon, talking yeah. about France at that time. Yeah. France is the only nation in the world concerning which the authentic record survives that as a nation she lifted her hand in open rebellion against the author of the universe. Can I interrupt there for just a second? Let's talk just a little bit about why that happened in France. Do, you all, do any of you remember the history and what was going on there? Totally out of control for quite a while. What was out of control? I say the whole nation was. Yeah, <coughs> but why? Because of the, the king and the opulence the kings that he at lived in. At one point in time, the Huguenots were there and other groups were there and Protestantism was spreading and so forth and then the king all of a sudden turned and said, no, we're going to go back to Catholicism. We're going to persecute all the Protestants and hundreds and thousands of Huguenots were killed and others escaped the country and so forth. And then eventually the, the Catholic Church became so repressive in France that we got this rebellion. So it's kind of a reaction formation it's a, against exactly. what was happening in their culture. Yeah. We don't want any religion if this yeah, is the way exactly. it's Exactly, if that's the way it's going to behave. So that helps us to understand a little bit about, and of course the question is, could something like that happen again? That's the big question. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Plenty of blasphemers, plenty of infidels there have been and still continue to be in England, Germany, Spain, and elsewhere. But France stands apart in the world's history as the single state which by the decree of her legislative assembly pronounced that there was no God and of which the entire population of the capital and a vast majority elsewhere women as well as men danced and sang with joy in accepting this announcement. It's from Blackwood's Magazine, November 1870, and also Ellen White in Great Controversy, about yeah. 269. Quoted. Well, th this, this whole thing that Jim has read is from Great Controversy, yeah. but Ellen White quoted a couple people there. Yeah, very good. And I think it might be helpful for some who aren't very familiar with this that uh, she would have footnoted some of this, but this is actually from Revelation 11, um, uh, 8, I believe, yeah, 8, where it's talking about the great city, yeah. Sodom, and, and uh, Be um, Egypt. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you read this in the Great Controversy, you'd probably pick up on that, but it's yeah. not so much in this quotation. But yeah, so she's, she's pulling this all together and it's right. reference. Very well. I mean, and remember, she lived. She was born just a few years after all this happened. So it was, it was pretty fresh in the memory of the world when, when all that was was going on. Yeah, pretty, pretty incredible, incredible situation. Well, Daniel 11 ends with the mention of the glorious or beautiful holy mountain. In Old Testament biblical times, this was a clear reference to Mount Zion in Jerusalem, as the capital of the Holy Land. Now I'm going to give you a little geography quiz now. What's the difference between Mount Moriah and Mount Zion? Time. Hmm? Time. No, I think they're two different peaks near Jerusalem. They're two different places. Mount Zion was near the, well, basically the location of the political or, or governmental okay. place. <clears throat> Mount Moriah is where the temple was located. Right, where Abraham brought Isaac to yeah. be sacrificed. So, yeah. yeah. So they're, they're close to each other, but not exactly okay. the same. But following the life and death of Jesus, God's people are not defined geographically, and Jim, you've mentioned that already. In that case, the holy mountain must be symbolic for all of God's people everywhere, not just a particular group living in a particular place. Well, one possible Interpretation of the final section of Daniel 11 is as follows. Carrie? One, the king of the south attacks the king of the north. The French Revolution attempted to eradicate religion and defeat the papacy, but failed. Two, 
The king of the north attacks and defeats the king of the south. The forces of religion headed by the papacy and its allies will eventually overcome the forces of atheism and will form a coalition with a defeated enemy. Okay, can I interrupt there now? We've suggest we have named several things that in our time represent atheism. We've talked about communism. We've talked about evolution. Could those things be overcome by <coughs> Roman Catholicism again? You think? They could join forces. Yes. Do we have any openly um, atheistic groups? Yes. Can you think of an example of recent, of recent times? A couple years ago, the Darwinists had signs painted on the <coughs> sides of buses in, 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 in London. It says, yes. there probably is no God, so go home and relax. Oh. <laughs> yes. well, what they just, um, Jim just quoted here was last night, wasn't it? Yeah, it was on. But with Ron Reagan, it, 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 a good portion of this. Bragging about not believing God. Yeah. 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 Crazy. I mean, they're paying money. I mean, those those spots are not free. They're... Well, he's got a foundation that promotes atheism. Yeah, but it's still, they pay for an advertisement, probably. Yeah, I don't know if they got a... Okay. Well, anything, anything that uh, yeah. ties in with naturalism uh, sort of leads towards atheism. You sure. know, some... People try to invite, you know, the Bible is is divine and human. You know, there are two phases, but the more human you try to make it, as with historical critical methods, the more you obscure or even obliterate God's participation in Scripture, and, and that's become sort of a functional atheism, where people will say that even Jesus' uh, mem um, miracles have a natural explanation. Yeah. So they try to explain everything according to natural order and it pushes God further and mm -hmm. further out of the picture. So we're seeing a lot of forces today that are moving in the direction of atheism. Well, do you think this whole uh, deal with climate change, you know, that they're, they're trying to get everybody together with this climate change thing, I mean, this is something that everybody could unite under that yeah. flag. Yep. Well, go ahead, Jim. Carrie. I haven't Carrie. finished. I'm sorry, Carrie. Yeah. Number three, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon will escape. Some of those not counted among God's true people will join the fold in the last hour. Four. What does that mean? <coughs> well, that's an interesting. Thing. Yeah. It, this is this is that's a that's a. A guess, uh, uh, but it seems to suggest that there will be, and I would suggest that it, it would mean that at the end of time, the two sides will be clearly portrayed. The God side will be clearer and clearer portrayed, and the other side be clearer. And there will be people who come out of the world and say, I don't want that anymore. I want to join God's side. That would be my understanding yeah. of that. For the king of the north prepares to attack the holy mountain but comes to his end. The forces of evil are destroyed and God's kingdom is established. And that comes from the Adult Sabbath School Study Guide for Thursday, March so, 19. Yeah, we know historically that the Roman Catholic Church reached out to every part of the world that they could control and tried to force everyone to worship it. Martin Luther himself, the leader of the Protestant Reformation, interpreted Daniel 11, 29-39, as referring to the leadership of the papacy with its doctrines and practices. This fits with our interpretation of Daniel 7 and 8 for the same period. Gordon? Ellen White from the Great Controversy said, <clears throat> no church within the limits of Romanish jurisdiction was long left undisturbed in the enjoyment of freedom of conscience. No sooner had the papacy obtained power than she stretched out her arms to crush all that refused to acknowledge her sway and one after another of the churches submitted to her dominion. Yeah, wow. And if you if you studied the Great Controversy, and, and Ellen White covers this, where were the places where more or less freedom of religion persisted and where Sabbath worship persisted? 
Ethiopia, way off away from Rome, and way over far to the east and some places over there. But, I mean, anything anywhere close to Rome, the Romans would get their tentacles on. Yeah, there was... Well, Daniel eleven thirty three says, Wise leaders of the people will share their wisdom with many others. But for a while, some of them will be killed in battle, be burnt to death, and some will be robbed and made prisoners. That pretty sounds pretty scary, doesn't it? This ver verse makes two things very clear. One, those who clearly understand God's plan will instruct many. Two, many of them shall fall by sword and flame by captivity and plundering. There are no specific time limits set on this prophecy, but we should not be so naive as to think that these things could not happen again in the future. Daniel 11.36, The king of Syria will do as he pleases. He will boast that he is greater than any god, superior even to the supreme god. He will be able to do this until the time when God punishes him. God will do exactly what he has planned. We've already suggested that. So who is the king of Syria in that? context. That would be the king of the north, and who are we saying that refers to? The papacy. Yeah. Well, there's other passages, Isaiah 14, 12 through 17. I'm watching the clocks, and we're running out of time. Second Thessalonians 2, 1 to 4. If you read those passages along with Revelation 12 to 14, there's a close working relationship among Satan himself and his two earthly associates, the papacy and, in the latter days, apostate Protestantism, as we have tended to call it. As we look over the broad sweep of Daniel 11, compare it with Daniel 2 and 7 and then 8 and 9, those three separate prophecies, we're reminded of the many ways in which God's people have suffered and been persecuted down through the generations. As we now approach the end of the book of Daniel, we can put together a chart covering all the major entities as modified here from our Bible study guide. So in Daniel 2 and 7, written during the days when Babylon was still in power, um, we have represented Babylon by the gold head and the, the, lion. the lion. Later, when Babylon had already passed off the scene, we have Persia, Medo-Persia represented by the silver of chest and shoulders, the bear and the ram in Daniel 8, and then by Persia, as mentioned in Daniel 11. Then Greece, we have represented by the bronze of the belly and thighs, the leopard and the goat, and then Greece is specifically named in, in, in or no, as mentioned in, in Daniel 11. Finally, we have pagan Rome, uh, represented by the iron legs, the dreadful beast, the little horn, the death of the Messiah, and the king of the north, death of the Messiah, again, using Nagi, Nagid, and there's parallels if we had time to talk about them in, in the original Hebrew. And finally, the last group is called what? Papal, Papal Rome, I guess. The last group except for God's kingdom. And of course, that was I, the iron, the little horn, the little horn, and the king of the north. And finally, we come down to the, king, the kingdom of God itself, represented in Daniel 2 as a stone that was cut out without hands, represented Daniel 7 as the kingdom given to the saints of the Most High, as, as a result of that judgment time in heaven. And then in Daniel 8 and 9, the demise of the little horn. And then in Daniel 11, the king of the north defeated at the glorious mountain. So <clears throat> I think we can see some pretty clear parallels between all those things. So it, it, they line up pretty well, in my opinion. What the rest do you think? Yeah. Yeah. So let us try to conclude. Throughout the Old Testament, the greatest dangers for the children of Israel arose out of the north. That would be physical dangers. Babylon was particularly noteworthy. Thus, the king of the north, down through history which, which opposed God's people, might be called Babylon. But when we turn to the New Testament, and there's a lot of references. If you, want, if you get our handouts, you'll have all of this material yourself. If You can go to our, to our website at Theox. Dot org. That's T-H-U-X dot O-R-G. Even in New Testament, we discover that the New Testament writers, particularly Peter were thinking about, referred to Rome as Babylon. Babylon. Applying these broad principles to our interpretation of Daniel 11, we are reminded that the one nation that openly defied God through its pharaoh was Egypt. 
Egypt as a nation is long, no longer a world power, but today Egypt must represent forces that mimic ancient Egypt, namely atheism and secularism. It's important for us to recognize that as Protestants are moving back closer and closer to the Roman Catholic Church and thus strengthening Rome and its position as the King of the North, many opposing forces, even in nation, nations like the United States, are very strongly enforcing evolutionary ideas, doing their best to reduce the influence of the Protestant Christianity and thus are, in effect, promoting atheism. So I'm going to jump back, well, down over a little bit here and we're going to read a, the famous passage Jim, I think you have it there. In the annals of human history, the growth of nations, the rise and fall of empires, appear as if dependent on the will and prowess of man. This shaping of events to a greater degree to be determined by his power, ambition, and caprice. But in the word of the in the word of God, the curtain is drawn aside, and we behold above, behind, and through all the play and counterplay of human interest and power and passions, agencies of all, excuse me, agencies of the all-merciful one, silently, patiently working out the counsels of his own will. Ellen White, Prophets and Kings, 499. So now the question is, in the last minute or two we have here, how do you think God works through these? Do you think that if you were among the people who are being persecuted by Babylon and taken off into captivity or Medo-Persia and so forth like this, do you think you would be able to see God's hand moving in all of that? Or is God's hand moving in that only possible to see if you're standing back a long way off like we are and sort of looking over the broad scope of things? I think we don't have to understand every little item to make it mean something. We have to have faith and trust in God's judgment and his love for us. We read in verse 33 of Daniel 11, those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many, yet they will fall by sword, by flame, by captivity, and by plunder for many days. So those who are truly on God's side will try to tell others and explain to others what the, how, they, how they interpret these passages. Are we doing our part? Are you doing your part in trying to understand these portions of Daniel and sharing that information with others. Others have speculated, some, have come, some commentators have just avoided saying much about Daniel 11 particularly at all. Others have speculated wildly, and you can read some crazy interpretations if you look at different commentaries. We have tried to take a middle-of-the-road approach, focusing on those things which seem to be fairly clear. May God continue to bless us as we study the book of Daniel. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for these insights that we have gained, although we recognize that not every part of Daniel 11 is perfectly clear. Nevertheless, we believe that they will come when we can sit down with you and you will be able to spread the whole, all that information out before us and it will be clear. But now we thank you for what we are able to know. We thank you for this time to come together and talk about your word. We thank you for Jesus Christ. Amen.